Okay, 2 o'clock rock. Here we are at Think Tech, and this is one of my favorite shows, Life After Statehood. And our regular contributor to this show is Ray Tsuchiyama, informed citizen. Today we're talking about retail. Retail. Retail in Hawaii, very important. You know, they used to say it was what? Military, agriculture, you know, hospitality. Well, retail. You could say it's part of hospitality, but I don't think so. Retail is like the fourth and since we lost some of the other three, right. <laughs> it becomes very important. A lot of the people from, you know, real estate sort of migrated into retail. A lot of people, you know, from various places and, and things. And vice versa. <laughs> and re and yeah. retail is probably more diverse because, you know, we had people coming from far away and establishing retail. We had nationals coming here for a long time, for maybe 150 years, actually, coming here to establish, um, you know, retail facilities. So retail is a story that needs to be told. We haven't really seen enough about it. But Ray Tsuchiyama has looked at it, and he remembers a lot of it. And so we have him here at first to explain, you know, how retail got started in the powerhouse it is today. Well, retail uh, really started in the late 19th century as uh, German immigrants uh, best uh, symbolized by the Hackfeld family that came in and opened up what we would say is a trading store. You know, uh, and, and the plantations needed all kinds of machinery, they needed uh, all kinds of uh, medicines, uh, foods, uh, all kinds of stuff for their daily um, uh, employees and for their, uh, the ruling elite of a plantation society at that time. So the uh, trading houses really emerged, uh, and of course the uh, cooks and castles and so forth got into uh, you know, business after being missionaries in the late 19th century. So they were also part of this boom in retail. And there were uh, small uh, shops, of course, that sold uh, uh, all kinds of daily necessities to uh, the people at the plantation camps. And that also was a retail kind of, uh, uh, kind of vehicle or something like yeah, that. Yeah, and the whole thing was that you wanted stuff. You didn't necessarily want to travel other places like right. the mainland to get stuff. So there, you know, grew up a whole infrastructure of middlemen and warehousing and agents, right? right. Retail agents, they were wholesalers uh, who, you know, built the infrastructure of retail. And that changed a lot, as we, we will see. Um, but starting from zero, we, we went a long way, even, what, by the First World War. That's right. And uh, the First World War, uh, there was already the Hackfeld fa family um, uh, really um, sensitive to their German roots. So they changed the name of their uh, company to American Factors. And, <laughs> and, heard fact, that. and yeah, fact. Yeah. And of course, uh, their uh, uh, premier um, department store of that time was changed again to Liberty House. Yeah. So again, you can see the uh, sea change within Hawaii was being more American. You had to really uh, uh, no longer depend on Europe for a lot of your uh, merchandise. It was from the West Coast or East Coast, wherever it came. Yeah. So there was a lot of, uh, like you say, a lot of um, uh, shipping, like the Matsons, uh, the uh, ships to come in from Los Angeles, Seattle, and San Francisco, uh, and far away from Boston, probably were a lot of intricate, complex uh, kinds of uh, what we call now the supply chain yeah. uh, getting to Hawaii. Yeah. And, uh, f f and ultimately, in the 20s and 30s, as uh, people began to uh, have more money, as a middle class began to grow, and people began to come to live outside the camps into Honolulu, they began to Buy things. Yeah, they began to grow stores and and uh, all kinds of uh, more more and more larger stores uh, began to happen. Now, uh, in the post-war period, uh, I can point out post World War One, uh, post uh, two uh, uh, World War Two period. Okay. Uh, in the early sixties, uh, Waikiki was still a very high class, high uh, uh, tourism area, and if you uh, go there even today, you can see the remnants of that. In front of Waikiki Beach, in front of the police station, there are three little buildings, and that used to be Gumps. Gumps? From <laughs> San Francisco. And that was a, a Tony uh, high-level shops for yeah. very uh, wealthy uh, you know, people who lived in the Gold Coast or visitors from uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, to do their shopping. And we forget that, but that was part of that 
ecosystem of restaurants like Canlis that had you know kimono waitresses and yeah, yeah. and very uh, I, nobody goes to, very few local people go into Waikiki to do high you know uh, uh, you know um, like um, uh, high level dining anymore because it's difficult for par parking. But, but for a time, yeah, for, for a time, time you wore a suit. You had to go Michelle's um, or uh, or Canlis. You had to wear it's a jacket. A special occasion. Yeah, you had uh, uh, Easter's and the Christmases and so forth. So retail uh, when we uh, see today and, and going back to the late 50s and 60s had uh, a thrust of the, uh, of, of the upper scale, upscale retail and dining in Waikiki. That's where it stu uh, stood out at that time yeah. before the whole onslaught of middle class visitors uh, tourism in the 60s and 70s. Yeah, and, and this, that means uh, after statehood, uh, that means just after statehood, means after the, uh, the Boeing uh, 707 right. came around, all of a sudden we had middle class. But until that time, it was exclusive. No? That's right, that's right. Uh, yeah. Very, very high up. And then comes the whole sea change again in the 80s with Japanese uh, um, uh, tourism. And uh, they began to spend far more than the um, visitors from Peoria or uh, Idaho or the Seattle. Or local. Yeah, or, or local, local people they, they who wanted spend, to buy things you know, 300, 400, 500 dollars a day. Yeah. Uh, you know, that in, and that's beyond their hotel and, and dining. They had money to spend. Suddenly there was a pent up demand for luxury goods. And that's where the lines for the Leo Vuittons and the Tiffany's and, and all kinds of uh, Italian and French and, and uh, British uh, uh, brand names began to spring up in Waikiki. And of course, that also began to raise rents for Waikiki. And you couldn't make money uh, having a burger shop in Waikiki, so you sold your lease to uh, uh, Louis Vuitton. And that, of course, accelerated the change, and, and that's what we have today. So now the gross was greater, the landlords take, and the landlords in those premises, most of them are charging percentage. That's right. Rent. They're uh, charging a per uh, square foot plus a percentage of yeah. gross uh, 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 sales. So you bring so in a national, international brand, and, and the Japanese love a national, international brand, trophy shopping. And so the gross was greater, the rent was greater, um, and all of a sudden it all spins up, and it spins out of sight of the local buyer. So there's, in some Somewhere along the line there, Ray, it, 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 it took a different path from the local economy to the, you know, I think retail was a good example of that. Yeah. And, and of course, uh, that unique Waikiki uh, retail also began to employ a different set of people, especially in the 80s, people who are bilingual, trilingual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had to speak Japanese, then Korean, and then Ch Ch Mandarin Chinese now. Uh, you had to, to come in from, uh, it, w it was a different kind of sale. It's a, it's a luxury sale. So you had the size of a customer. The customers also had thousands of dollars to spend. And uh, they were coming in from not only Japan, Singapore, uh, Europe, uh, from uh, New York, from, of course, Tokyo. It was a different uh, atmosphere and, um, of, of, of retail. Well, it was a hustle because there was a lot of money on the tree. Shake the tree, the money falls off, and you did a lot better if you were a salesperson working on a commission, even not working on a commission. The store did better if you were serving, say, Japanese clientele. So I remember many times, you know, people complaining back in the 80s. Um, I don't think this happens anymore, but it used to happen on a regular basis. So you're in a store, local person, you're in a store and you want to buy something and there's a Japanese buyer right next to you, a tourist that obviously you, know, you always notice, you, you can see right away he's from Japan. Um, and you're there, he's there, the clerk goes to him. You, you don't get first treatment, you get second treatment and he's spending 10 times as much as you are and happy about it. And you can't get a bargain, you're, you're happy to get out of there with your skin on because it's so expensive. But this is the, the prices, right? The retail prices went way up. The quality, the national brands went way up. Uh, and I think people really couldn't shop. Local people could not shop in those places. You know, not only because you, that you wouldn't get served first, and they were irritated about that, <laughs> but because they couldn't afford it. But there was a slice of uh, the society that used to travel to the mainland, uh, to San Francisco, the Union Square, for example, uh, and, and, and really shop at the uh, Bloomingdale's or the uh, Macy's uh, of the, uh, maybe t two or three times a year, especially before Christmas. So there was a group that went out that couldn't 
find the uh, high-class uh, department stores in Hawaii. But you're correct, that's a small sliver of the society. And, uh, and, and, and I think it changed the society that it used to be a much slower-paced place, that you weren't judged on the uh, type of watch you had, you weren't judged on the clothes you had. It was a quite an egalitarian society when you think about it back in the 70s, still, that uh, it was uh, a place where you could uh, be at home anywhere in Hawaii. That, T-shirt was fine, yeah, it, and, and slippers and, were and, fine. And, yeah. and suddenly there was a change that you were judged on the number of things you had in your house, uh, on the, in a huge uh, uh, you know, a plasma display TV, the stereo the cars, the watches, the clothes, um, everything began to change, I think, uh, uh, in, especially in the 90s and 2000s. And part of that was invidious comparison, don't you think? I mean, for example, um, people, boy, they were surrounded with retail. Retail, you know, was feeding them anything and everything, all kinds of things you could buy, and, the, you know, and the, the ad men were trying to sell you all these things, and so you would buy more than you could possibly <laughs> use, more than you could possibly afford. I think it took a dent in a lot of budgets to have all these things to buy and then people would have relatively small apartments or homes and they'd jam up the home with all this stuff and then what happens is the storage business. <laughs> the storage <laughs> business right. comes to town because people bought all this stuff, they have no place for it and you have to keep on going. It's like, it's like a, a habit. Right. You have to keep on buying even though you know, you don't need a lot of the stuff you buy. Well, I, I think uh, you have a, a very good point, and also about the economy, where um, uh, people began to uh, extend on credit. So, so they had to work uh, t not only two jobs, maybe three jobs. Uh, they began to rely more on, you know, uh, on uh, all kinds of uh, uh, things that they uh, didn't do before, but they had to go to Vegas, they had to go to Disneyland, they had to go to this. So there was a lot more uh, loans taken out, uh, a lot more, um, it was an economy that was, uh, even today, I think the real economy is here, but how we're living is here. Frost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the real economy is... Uh, deadly, uh, deadly for right, an island community. That, that it reminds me of a Venezuela or you know, yeah. Greece or many yeah. countries that, uh, that uh, the governments really... Uh, um, um, uh, borrowed in order to, you know, uh, kind of um, give money or uh, all to their government and state employees to keep them happy. And after a while, they can't borrow anymore. And, and, but going back to about retail itself, uh, if you look at uh, the concept of retail, it's a, a recent phenomenon that people have time to go to shop. People have time to look at sure. things. That's recreation, <laughs> man. That's recreation. <laughs> because in, in 100 years ago, you spent your whole day farming or uh, doing things as an artisan or whatever to really uh, do crafts and so forth uh, or to see that you have your food, your potatoes or cane or uh, views grow. So leisure time uh, began to uh, uh, become more in abundance in, in the state after statehood. And remember, people didn't uh, go to work in plantation the, uh, you know, from 6 o'clock to 6 o'clock, but there was the, even on Lanai, they had uh, until recently the, uh, uh, the horn that blasted yeah, out. Yeah, i tell you when and to then, stop yeah. the horn. Yeah. <laughs> so so the, uh, at Hawaii, I think, Coming to the mainland, because the mainland has some winters and so forth, you're in, you can go out every day. And so I think, and also, I hate to say this, there aren't that many things to do. You know, I, no, that's true. <laughs> you can't go to museums. Yeah. You can't go to the symphonies. Yeah. Uh, you can't yeah. go. To, you know, many and, things. And that, not, not a, not a yeah. large number of people can actually go surf or do water <laughs> right. sports on the right. beach. So what do you do? You go to Alamona. Shop. <laughs> to, you <laughs> shop till you drop. <laughs> you go to Alamona. So so and and so the uh, shopping centers uh, became uh, our town uh, s uh, greens or you know like on the mainland. You meet your neighbors and uh, and according to the Costco's <laughs> uh, uh, have have really reflected. I see my neighbors more in Costco than I see them, you know, in, in my condo. But they're completely different. <laughs> like we, we have to examine that. Right after this break, right we have to examine the emergence, the development of these big shopping centers, huge big shopping centers, and how they became more than just a conglomeration of stores, how they became a kind of community, ersatz community. And then we have to see the transition from, from those big shopping centers to Costco-like big boxes. This is very interesting, and we are a perfect laboratory for all this to happen. Wow, Hawaii, the land where you shop till you drop. We'll be right back after this break. 
Hello, this is Martin Despain. I want to get you get excited about my new show, which is Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. We're going to broadcast on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha, I'm Kawe Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 3 p.m. We address issues of importance for those of us who live here on the most isolated landmass on the planet. Please come join me Fridays at 3 p.m. Mahalo. Aloha, my name is Richard Emery, host of Condo Insider. More than a third of Hawaii's population live in some form of association. And our show is all about educating board members and owners about their responsibilities and obligations and providing solutions for a great association. You can watch me live on Thursdays, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. each week. Aloha. Bingo, we're back here on Think Tech. We're doing Life After Statehood with Ray Tsuchiyama, who is an informed citizen and a regular contributor to this program and others. And today we're talking about, um, you know, shop till you drop, the awesome reality of retail in Hawaii. So we have the shopping centers emerge, and it was uh, not a zero-sum game, but they drew off a lot of business from the mom and pops. And the mom and pops at the beginning of these big shopping centers, they were in the shopping centers. But as time went by, the owners and managers of the shopping center weren't interested in our mom, moms and pops. They wanted national names because they could get better rents. And so little by little, the mom, moms and pops went out of the shopping centers. They had to fend for themselves in smaller centers. And ultimately, you know, we have very few of them left, actually, in the larger picture. Um, can you talk about the emergence of these shops? Talk, talk about Ala Moana, for example. Well, Ala Moana is a very unique case because um, in the United States, it was kind of like a pioneer <laughs> for a small state that, that just became a, um, a state in 59. Because you look back in the early 60s, it was you know, little duck farms <laughs> and marshland uh, right next to Waikiki. And it was built up at, with a very kind of utopian kind of uh, 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 vision and plan that if you look way back, it was supposed to have in the future, and this is back in the early mid 60s into the 60s, a whole city by itself, more like a Mall of America kind of idea in a little, uh, a little island with hotels and apartments and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, probably a lot of amenities for people who go there not only to shop, and so there's you know theme parks at other uh, other shopping centers, but uh, you're correct that uh, the, uh, what uh, happened with people and buying preferences and so forth was that as you know up till the 707 and and the um, and the uh, mats and containers in the late 50s and 60s, people may do with very little in Hawaii. And when you go back in time, people made their own clothes. <laughs> sure, yeah, with remember the, all the with stores. Yeah, with the, 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 you had to buy your own cloth, and your mom yeah. or grandma or you know, dry people, goods, the textile stores. And, Every and city in town had one. That's right, and you made your own suit, and you know you had one suit uh, for Sundays and <laughs> or Christmas, and and you. But it was uh, uh, tailor made, and uh, there was a lot of things that were you know we think of our society as being sustainable. It was a very sustainable society back in the uh, you know, up till uh, uh, statehood. And statehood exploded uh, like this, and I think, it, and and the other thing that we forget always is cars. Uh, since uh, uh, Honolulu did not uh, evolve uh, with mass transit uh, back in the 50s or didn't continue the trolley, it made a whole leap into cars immediately. So that Alamana is not linked to any place by rail or mass transit, uh, of course by buses, but by cars. So people had to get cars in order to get there. So uh, it was really a, a, a central place to come and park. And you see how much parking there is. And people you know, quibble about parking, but they have parking there. And the demise of mom and pops is that in order to buy something, even if it takes three minutes, you take a car. <laughs> and you don't walk anymore to uh, your neighborhood store, and they're all gone. They're, they're all, all gone. gone. They're yeah, all gone. yeah. Well, Ala Moana was uh, really fabulous, and you, when you think about it, Ala Moana was an out, an out, an outspring of, of, of statehood itself. Because uh, if Ala Moana opened in what '64, I think, right. um, it had to be planned for a few years. Right. So what happened is that the people who were taking power, who were getting involved in business, right at statehood, 
it was an expression of, a, of an optimistic future right. for Hawaii in tourism and retail and the middle class. So they designed and built uh, Al Moana. It was fabulous, Dillingham. And, right. and when you think about all the transactions that have happened, and now we're Al Moana, one of the biggest shopping centers in the world, one of the most uh, you know, profitable shopping centers in the world, there isn't any local ownership at all. It went through these hands and right. those hands. We can talk about all the right. owners, but at the end of the day, no local owners. And, and I was sad because uh, Hawaii, in terms of all these large projects, including retail projects, is owned by REITs on the right. mainland. Right. Uh, REITs who actually don't pay income tax here because it's a, <laughs> a pass-through tax arrangement. And so what we have is uh, retail is very profitable because we are kind of a retail laboratory. <laughs> right. we, are, we are first adopters, oh, yeah. um, and, and we don't have any control over yeah, it. People spend a lot more money than other, other states, and yeah. uh, they own a lot of more things. Yeah. But again, going back to statehood, you're absolutely right that the years leading up to Ala Moana, people uh, before Christmas pour through the Sears and Roebuck uh, catalog. The pennies catalog, all the catalogs that used to be, they, they uh, in the plantation days, that's what they wanted. All these things and for the mainland that they couldn't, uh, there were no stores to sell these. So there were people who owned things like radios and so forth, but they were shipped in through catalogs. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, that was a, a, a lifestyle of many people until the stores began appearing. Right. And they were uh, just seduced by brands, uh, by, uh, you know, they no longer says, oh, I, I got this at uh, Ross or I got this, you know, by the tailor down the street. Uh, you know, it's, it's a brand name. It's a Sears product. It's yeah, a yeah. Penny's people product. Are, people uh, in Hawaii brand. really got into that. Yeah, it's a brand name. You had to buy the best brand. It yeah. was another invidious comparison thing. Um, you know, the other thing is, uh, I talked before about the middlemen. That's what came up, you know, when, as uh, around statehood time, in order to have all the goods on the shelves, we, we didn't have a lot of, um, you know, air cargo, we had it by ship, it took a couple of weeks. Um, so there was these whole, a whole generation of middlemen, of wholesalers, and they lasted until probably the 80s, and then they all went out of business because you could get better shipment, you could do right. drop shipment, shipment, you could you know, ship on demand. Uh, and of course, we started out with the internet somewhere right. along a after that, yeah, yeah. which has changed Online. everything and yeah, will change yeah, yeah. everything. Um, but you know, when we, when we did Ala Moana, and we saw it all come together, and we saw first one level of stores, and then a second level of store. It's amazing, and then a third level of, and a fourth level. I mean, it's incredible if you could do like time lapse photography <laughs> on how big that place got. And and as it got big, the mom and pops went it went away. The small regional, you know, around the corner shopping centers, even the, the ones that were not so small either. Um, they, they all went away, and we, we focused, we all draw on Ella Moana. And that, as of, what, 10 years ago, dominated everything in retail. But there came the big boxes. This had to change things, too. Right. How did that happen? Well, uh, interestingly, uh, you know, I, my neighbor in Tokyo was with Costco, <laughs> and uh, the headquarters is in Kirkland, is in Seattle. And uh, he told me one day, uh, as we, uh, we were talking, he said, we never thought that it would get this big. <laughs> and he was a Harvard MBA, yeah. and uh, he, they were doing Costco's in Japan and Taiwan, never really entered in mainland China, although that's a long story. And of course, they went every place in all 50 states and territories and so forth. Uh, and it, it evolved uh, through a, you know, a kind of a loop uh, hole in, in regulations where you, know, you, you could sell wholesale, but you could be a business by you know, becoming a member uh, of this uh, network of people who was going to s uh, be a business and so forth. Do you know uh, anybody who is not a member <laughs> of Costco? <laughs> you know, it, it, well, it's like in, uh, um, in, in certain parts of the uh, uh, country, there are dry cities, but you become a member at a club where you can the, get Sure, drink. same so, thing. Yeah, a very simple. Wink in the blink. Uh, right. <laughs> so, so, and it grew exponentially, uh, you know, and, and uh, what, of course, Hawaii people, just like anybody else in the world, are driven by low prices. If I see milk uh, from the mainland at this price and, and uh, local milk, I'll choose lo mainland milk because it's cheaper. And it's, you know, uh, and people talk about, you know, sustainability and about, uh, about supporting your local, uh, you know, uh, brands or, or companies. We're driven by 
low prices. Sure, we are. <laughs> and, and so that's why, you know, local agriculture hasn't made that much progress because it's cheaper and people are going to buy the cheaper thing. In fact, if you take that on a larger scale, what's happened is our self-reliance right. you spoke about before has been undermined by cheap prices from somewhere else. That's right. And it's really bad. It's, it's a drug. It's, it's really, it's a it's drug. A drug. It's, it's addictive. And, and when I was at Castle and Cook, um, there's an interesting uh, um, thought that somebody said. There came a day uh, in, in containers and, and so forth and, and shipping when a ton of carrots cost the same as a ton of fertilizer. <laughs> At that point, uh, we never, we ne why grow? Why, 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 why buy the fertilizer? <laughs> why, why grow Why anything? work? Yeah, why, why not you know, buy cheap, yeah. uh, cheaply? So uh, again, that, that was a drug that uh, uh, derailed Hawaii uh, and, and uh, really uh, the conversion of you know, sugar or pineapple into agriculture or the sustaining of, of uh, dairy farms or you know, in the, in the, up till the 40s and into the 50s, probably even in Maui or other places, there was a, uh, a soft drink and milk bottling plant for every region of the island. And there were milk delivered in, in bottles to you every morning. <laughs> what a sustainable society. Trying to find a dairy now. <laughs> there, uh, there's only two or three left. Yeah, and and, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the people around the dairy resisted, on right. Kauai, for example. That's right. P Piero Midiar. <laughs> but you know what, what? What I get out of this is that is that the local people looking for the best price, because people will do that, and right. people in Hawaii are Akamai about oh, yeah, price. Yeah. Uh, they're going to go to the big box stores because right. they get a significantly better price than they would get in Palm Court in Alamoana or any big shopping center. And so you have this for the tourists and the well-heeled and the ones who like to shop and, and can shop in Palm Court and the tourists. Yeah, did I send that? Right. And then you get, you get the big boxes. The right. big boxes is where the local people go because the prices are better. So it's, it's kind of gone in two directions. And, and the local people, of course, um, uh, there's a, a drive for uh, more freezer space, <laughs> more, more uh, you know, space in your house, and then it overflows, you have to put it in storage. <laughs> you go look at it every week, if it, you know, and draw some things out, yeah. uh, and then you draw more of your visa card to buy more things, and then you take out a second mortgage. I mean, it, it is a, a cycle that is, it is not sustainable. Yeah. You, did you say rat race? Uh, no. You I work hard at <laughs> three jobs, you can go oh, right, and buy right. things, yeah. and you can only use them for so long, you That's have right. to buy more things, you put them in storage, right. you're spending much too much money, and we live, you know, and that's recreation. Right. That's recreation. Right. Yes. So this is not sustainable, and this is so far away from the real Hawaii, the Hawaii that you grew up in, the Hawaii that I enjoyed when I was here years ago, when I first came. Um, and so we have lost something, and I'm not sure that retail and what we've been talking about is the cause or the effect. You know, did it, did it create this, and, this and, lack and of... And it's an economy by itself. Within the larger economy, yeah, <laughs> and 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 no, but no economist would point to retail as a, as 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 part of the economy. In a, in a in a in a real economy, you make things and you and you uh, sell them and you get money for them. Yeah, you see, uh, here in Hawaii, the brands are of Hawaii, yeah. and we're selling them Singapore, Japan, or uh, the mainland, or and then making money. And money comes back, yeah. and then people become you know uh, richer because yeah. of the, of the products that we make. So let me. Let me let me offer this thought to close, okay. and that is, you know, we talk about $6 billion going overseas out of Hawaii, hard-earned money going out of Hawaii to buy fossil fuel. Everybody gets excited about that. Let's stop doing that. Let's use renewables, right. which are local oh, yes. and indigenous and, you know, clean and all right. that. Um, but you know what? We're sending out a lot more money for retail of things that are manufactured uh, uh, elsewhere and right. that are delivered here to our door things that we could do ourselves, we used to do ourselves, but we have given that up. We are just as dependent That's right. on offshore real, uh, you know, re um, retail uh, than, than we are on fossil fuel. We have become a dependent society, Ray. That's the bottom line of That's this right. discussion. I agree. I agree totally. And, it's, it's, uh, and, and we have to have another plan or vision to take us out of it because it will overwhelm us in, in the end. It will be we, we become a different different society, a harsher, meaner, and a society that is living beyond its means. The real economy is here, and where we're living is here. Right, and we lose our heart. Yeah. yeah. Ray Tsuchiyama, he still has a big heart, <laughs> and he's a regular contributor and informed citizen here on Life After State. And I so enjoy the show. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. <laughs>